So good morning, everyone, um, and welcome to this session on global health and pandemics. This is the fourth time we have a session on pandemics. Uh, the first one was a virtual session in 2020, you may remember. Uh, before anything, I'd like to thank Thierry de Montbrial. Thank you, Madame Kwan, for inviting us. Uh, and uh, Madame Minister, thank, warmly thank uh, the government of the UAE for the wonderful welcome and hosting this conference. Um, we have a, an excellent panel of speakers today with broad expertise in global health and geopolitics. Uh, but before we start, I'd like to show one slide for everyone to remember about key figures on COVID-19 as the political attention and the public opinion attention is rapidly waning. What people often call the cycle of panic and neglect, <laughs> we are actually in a phase of neglect. Um, and that's why I entitled this slide, COVID-19, are we being dismissive? So let's not forget that the COVID-19 pandemic has been the worst combined health and socioeconomic crisis in living memory. It has infected at least 250 million people across the globe, and the global death toll is estimated to be 27, between 18 and 33 million people. At the highest point of the pandemic, 90% of school children across the world were unable to attend school. At least 150 million people have been pushed to extreme poverty. And the economic cost has been huge, estimated by the IMF at being $14 trillion to be lost in the period 2024, the toughest shock to the global economy since World War II. And the last point on the slide is that the pandemic is not over and it continues to have a profound impact on the lives and livelihoods for many people, millions of people with what we call long COVID, but also as the economic recovery, whereas it somehow is taking place in the high income countries, it still is very slow in recovery in the poorest countries. So we'll discuss today about where we are with the pandemic and which are the perspectives uh, of preparing ourselves to a next pandemic. And the question that is posed today is, are we ready for a next pandemic? Now, our first speaker will be Professor Antoine Flao, who is the director of the Global Health Institute uh, of, in Geneva. He's also the director of the Swiss School of Public Health in Zurich. And let me say that sadly, and somehow ironically, two of our six panelists today are stuck with COVID in Geneva. <coughs> that is Professor Flao and El Storele. Two out of six of us have COVID as we speak. And uh, that can be a, a strong reminder, again, to all of us that the epidemic is not over. So, Antoine, the floor is yours. Thank you, Michel, for your kind words. And um, thank you also uh, to Thierry de Montréal for his uh, faithful invitation, uh, World Policy Conference after World Policy Conference, and particularly talking about covid I wish I'd be uh, in Abu Dhabi today, uh, here in Geneva, the weather is ugly, uh, windy, rainy, uh, and very cold. So I wish you the best for the conference. Yes, you asked me um, to talk about um, COVID-19, where are we today, and where are we moving to? The next slide, please. What happened in one year? 
Last year, we talked about the situation and what did happen in one year. I would like to mention just two elements, two major events. One, if you remember, that was in December, very shortly after our World Policy Conference in Abu Dhabi last year, when China decided to shift from its zero COVID policy to a more global policy with regard with COVID, uh, more mitigation policy. I mentioned this event because it was a major and tragic event for China. When China officially reported 90,000 deaths after, in the weeks after uh, the, sh the lift of zero COVID strategy, it has been estimated that it is probably more than 1.4 million deaths which occurred. And many uh, uh, models also mention a uh, uh, death toll of 2 million deaths in China only in a few weeks after the lift of the, uh, the end of the zero COVID strategy. The second uh, very major event was when the general director of WHO in Geneva declared the end of the public health emergency of international concern. He associated this declaration with a call for vigilance because new variants could emerge in the coming months and years. And you can see at the bottom right panel of this slide, in the UK, there is a soup of subvariants of Omicrons which have emerged and which are co-circulating today uh, in, in the UK, but of course, in all over the world. Next slide, please. So where are we now? Michel, you mentioned uh, the tragedy of, of uh, this COVID pandemic with a cumulative death toll as reported of 7 million deaths, but which has been estimated between 18 and 33 million deaths, as you said. We have to add to that, to these figures, more than 20 million lives which were saved due to the vaccine only in the first year of its deployment. And I think we have to add, but it has not been clearly estimated up to date, is the number of lives saved thanks to the lockdowns and to the non-pharmaceutical interventions. Next slide, please. Where are we now? In fact, as you said, Michel, the pandemic is not over. When you see the circulation of the waves, you can see easily that in the last year, we have known a couple of waves of circulation of hospitalization and also of deaths due to COVID. Just in Canada, if you see the figures on the right, you can notice that the total number of hospitalizations in 2023 so far is bigger than the total number of hospitalization due to COVID in the first year of the pandemic in 2020. One of the reasons is that it is not a seasonal disease. It's not like flu. It's all along the year disease, which trigger some severe forms of COVID and some hospitalizations and deaths. Next slide, please. And even if we know that it is not over, because probably we want to listen only the positive and optimistic side of the end of the public health um, emergency of international concern, of the alert, of the status of emergency, we have mo mostly give up with most of the surveillance tools, a form of disarmament in the middle or maybe at the end of the war, but not when the war is finished. And we can see on the right that the, not the case fatality ratio, but the 
case hospitalization ratio. What does that mean? That means that the number of hospitalization in the UK divided by the number of infection has dramatically decreased over time, thanks to the vaccines, of course, and also to the repeated waves of COVID, which uh, enhance and sustain the, uh, the immunity against the disease and the severe forms of the disease. So fortunately, now we are much less prone to being hospitalized when we caught COVID. These figures has only been done because of the excellent epidemiological system in the UK. They have some random sampling of the British population in each nation of the British population, which provide very precise figures no one in the world today has succeeded to reach. This is a major lesson we should learn from the pandemic. This UK example. On the left of the panel, you have a French example, which was completely visionary regarding analysis of wastewater. Wastewater surveillance is very well correlated with the circulation of the virus, but also it allows for detecting early new variants and the circulation of new variants in a country. In Switzerland, for instance, we have detected, thanks to wastewater, the Pirola subvariant, the new worrying subvariant which is emerging today in the world, before in the wastewaters, before it, it was seen in clinical settings. So the wastewaters is really a, a very interesting tool. And surprisingly, France, which was visionary and ahead of time, had given, had given up. They have stopped their wastewater surveillance in 2022, in spring 2022. Fortunately, now they are coming back again. Next slide, please. One of the most important lessons we have learned regarding the mode and the route of transmission is the fact that it is an airborne disease. It is due to the micro droplets which float in the air indoor when it is poorly ventilated and which contaminate us because we breathe 20 times a minute and uh, we are infected and reinfected and reinfected again in uh, a train, in a coach of a train, in a classroom, in a school, in a hospital, in a home care facility, in office, in bars and restaurants. So we have learned that we should wear masks, that we should keep distance, well, that we are better outdoor than indoor not to catch the disease that we should invest in ventilation, that we should monitor a proxy of the indoor air quality, which is CO2 concentration, and that we can filter the air when we cannot ventilate enough. Next slide, please. Improving air quality is key. It has been well settled by a lot of evidence today. Italian, for instance, have demonstrated that just by appropriate, appropriate ventilation of classrooms in schools, you can reduce by 80% the number of contamination in children. And as Michel said, the kids were those segments of the populations which pay a lot of tributes to this pandemic. We probably could be able to eliminate most of the Viral respiratory disease, not only viral. Tuberculosis is also totally airborne, an airborne disease. We could eliminate this disease to the same extent as we have succeeded to eliminate waterborne disease like cholera or dysentery um, in the 20th century, thanks to the development and thanks to water sanitation. So with air sanitation, with an indoor air quality which is appropriate, we could probably eliminate most of the burden of these respiratory disease, COVID, but also influenza, RSV, and many others. Next slide, please. As you said, Michel, 
it remains uh, a lot of unknowns in this pandemic. And you mentioned the persistent COVID symptoms. And there are more than 50 long-term effects of COVID, uh, which is so-called the long COVID today, and which is mostly unknown, poorly diagnosed, poorly recognized. Many people are suffering after their COVID, even mild COVID. And it has been estimated that 10% of the infected people will suffer from persistent effect of COVID. And we have no treatment or very few treatments. So we we need to invest much more in this uh, segment of the post-COVID problems. Next slide. I wanted to, to mention something which is highly political, uh, which is the fact that disinformation comes from populism and anti-science movement. I apologize, I don't want to be partisan, but it is a fact today to see that those who voted for Trump in America were much less vaccinated than those who voted for Biden, and it has a dramatic impact on their mortality, and they had a lot of mortality in excess. It has been estimated that more than 200,000 people died, were killed due to disinformation, due to anti-science movement, and that is a very worrying issue. On the right side of the panel, you have the optimistic figures which show that public information campaign is a major key determinant for the success of the response to the pandemic. So going to the stage and talking with evidence, with science on the COVID pandemic is something which saves lives. Next slide. And this is my concluding remarks, just to say we are probably much better and perform much better in crisis management than in crisis prevention. We are not very good to prevent disease. We have faced a tragedy with, I don't know, 25 million deaths plus 25 saved lives due to the intervention during the crisis. But we are not able today to take the lessons, to learn the lessons we have as a legacy of this pandemic. We are not able to implement an appropriate appropriate surveillance tool. We are not able to invest in prevention like proper indoor air quality. We are still not able to invest in research against these long COVID issues. And we are facing strong anti-science, which refrains some politicians to invest and to continue to invest in, for instance, mask mandates or in hospitals or in home care facility or in uh, things people do not want anymore to hear today. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Antoine. Thank you. Um, Are we able to draw the lessons from the pandemic um, in terms of prevention, preparedness, in terms also of addressing a major failure of all of us during the crisis, which was the, has been the unequal, dramatically unequal access to vaccines across the world. That's the topic that El Storelli, who is a fellow with the Institute uh, of, uh, uh, sorry, Innovation and Public Purpose at University College London will now address. May I just ask all our speakers to stick to their time as we are already a little late on the program. Else, the floor is yours and thank you. Hope you feel better. Thank you, Michel, for the kind introduction and, and for the well, uh, good wishes. I uh, have recovered. Meanwhile, I was just confirmed myself uh, testing negative this morning. So, uh, but unfortunately, I couldn't travel to, to be with you. And, and yes, what, what I will uh, look at or talk about in the, in the next uh, 10 minutes is really uh, looking back to the COVID response uh, 
I think in addition to all the, the non-pharmaceutical interventions that Antoine uh, eloquently talked about, I think one major success stood out, which is our collective scientific community came together and in a record time was able to create and produce effective vaccines that have dramatically limited the risk of severe death, uh, uh, severe disease and, and, and deaths uh, during, uh, during uh, COVID. We were also lucky, we have to admit that, uh, the bet that scientists made uh, that this uh, famous spike protein would indeed be able to elicit an adequate re immune response paid off. And also, several of the existing vaccine technology platforms, uh, from the classic attenuated viruses to these newer uh, viral vector platforms, and especially at the meanwhile famous uh, messenger RNA, mRNA platform, they could rapidly be adapted to this new virus. And this was not just luck. This was also the result of massive investments, public uh, and taxpayers' uh, investments into research and development over many years, and then, of course, massive investments uh, during uh, the response. However, as, as indicated already by Michel, the main failure of our collective COVID response has been that large parts of the world were precluded from the timely and equitable access uh, to these life-saving vaccines that would have been able to avoid many more uh, deaths and probably would also have been much more effective in controlling uh, the pandemic. And just uh, to, to, uh, for, for, um, uh, to remind you that 15 months after the vaccines became available, mainly in high income countries, and where even persons with very low risks of getting ill, including children, were being vaccinated, most countries in Africa had not been able to vaccinate even their healthcare workers that were at the first line and at high risk of, of getting ill or the most vulnerable populations. And as you know, the risk of dying increases uh, significantly with age and with uh, co-infections or comorbidities. Uh, and so those people, because that is what equity means, right? Equity means that those who need it most, those that are at that highest risk of getting ill, should be prioritized. And that is not at all what we did. And that was at the extreme inequity that Dr. Tedros, the director of the World Health Organization, referred to as vaccine apartheid. That is really uh, what happened. So are we ready for the next pandemic uh, to do better in terms of vaccine equity or countermeasure uh, equity, because it's not just vaccines, it's also access to diagnostics and, and treatments. Now, in order to respond to that, we need to understand why we ended there. And there are many factors that contributed. Uh, the initial scarcity uh, led to hoarding and vaccine nationalism with countries buying up all the stocks of these newly produced vaccines to be able, again, to vaccinate their whole population even multiple times while other uh, countries were precluded to even buy uh, vaccines for their health workers. But also a very important reason was that a handful of companies held monopolies on the science and technology and therefore controlled the production and availability of these vaccines and were able to actually decide how much to produce, when, to whom to sell and at what price. And while wielding monopoly power to control maxi markets and maximize revenues, Maybe normal business practice in many economic sectors, but here we're talking life-saving vaccines, developed moreover with massive public investments, and we're in the biggest health crisis of our lifetime. And so while it was astounding that many normal business practices were interrupted or dramatically changed, I mean, think about lockdowns, I mean, we've never done such a dramatic intervention in our economy. Somehow the powers that be didn't think that it was needed to do something about uh, the pharmaceutical business ecosystem and trusting that the market mechanisms could be uh, relied upon to deliver. And so we know uh, how that ended. Now, we have to acknowledge that some vaccine producers, uh, AstraZeneca together with the Oxford uh, vaccine, and some Chinese producers did enable some local production in a few countries. But this was largely insufficient. It was too little too late uh, to really supply the, work, the world. And many producers that were trying to obtain such licenses were refused. 
and here, very importantly, the producers of the mRNA vaccines that became very quickly the preferred option in many countries, they totally refused to, refused to share their technology, instead doubling down on scaling up their own production capabilities. And this was even more dramatic because one of the key advantages of this novel technology that it's actually relatively easy to produce as compared to traditional vaccines. It's also very suitable for this decentralized medium scale production and they can quickly be adapted to new variants. But both Moderna and Pfizer and Biotech chose to keep tight control of their technology. So what is it that we must do differently? The first is to really have a change of perspectives. Life-saving health technologies, especially in times of pandemics, cannot be viewed as private commercial goods. They should, first of all, be considered as essential public health tools, instruments for public policy. And that's not a technical issue. That is really a political choice. And it means also that policymakers must be able to use and uh, these tools and implement such policies as they see fit to control the pandemic. And in wealthy countries, the market-based pharmaceutical ecosystem may be able to deliver. And that's clearly what most Western policymakers think. Uh, but as we have seen, that doesn't deliver for the rest of the world. And so governments in other parts of the world were not able to use these tools to implement the best public health response. They, could, they couldn't buy and they couldn't produce. So what can we do to ensure that countries in the global south, and we're talking actually about a majority of the world population, eh, let's be clear, can do differently to secure the health of their populations? Well, what they say is we do no longer want to be recipients and beggars. We actually want to be part of the solutions to contribute as full participants to the research and development of diagnostics, vaccines and treatments and to be able to respond to epidemic outbreaks when and where they occur, not waiting until it is uh, a pandemic, but actually, or waiting until Western pharmaceutical business uh, models develop the products that we can use to uh, uh, stop outbreaks when and where they occur. And so for that, what they need is access to the technologies and the know-how for health innovation. And the freedom to, to, to do research and produce without any uh, constraints such as intellectual property rights, which again are a policy tool, they're not a natural right. And they also need access to, of course, the capital to build and sustain the needed infrastructure, for instance, through regional R&D hubs. And of course, all of this, that it needs to be considered as common goods for health, not private commodities for business, because we're talking about uh, the biggest life, uh, uh, health crisis in our lifetime and maybe future ones. Um, and so you all know the, the saying, eh, give a person a fish, a fish and they will eat today. Teach them how to fish and especially allow them to fish in the collective knowledge point and they will actually be able to take care of themselves. And because that's actually what we do today, we stop them from actually using the knowledge and technology to develop their own uh, solutions. And again, this is a political choice uh, for, for that we have done. And we know in military, there is this concept of technological arms race and you don't want to share your technology, but it's a mistake. And actually we do it too often to compare health security with uh, military security. And it's a mistake to use that language and that thinking and that narrative for global public health. Health threats are very different. Advantages in health technologies in one country do not translate in health security. No one is safe until everybody is safe against epidemic threats. We all know that viruses and other uh, pathogens, they cannot, cannot be contained by borders. And that's why it's so critical that more countries and regions are allowed to and empowered to be part of that health e innovation ecosystem, not as competitors in a global market, but as contributors to global health security that then can be viewed as a global common good. And so that is the essence, in essence, the type of transformational change we need for true preparedness. And that will allow to put equity at its heart as demanded today by many global uh, South countries, for instance, in the discussions about uh, the, the uh, pandemic treaty. That is what they, that they want to be allowed 
to establish maybe a parallel ecosystem in other parts of the world. We don't, we can, if the Western world says we want to continue how we do it, fine. But can we create a space such that in other parts of the world, there can be different ways of uh, addressing that? And this is not utopic. For today, for instance, there is an initiative driven by the World Health Organization in which uh, a, a hub for mRNA technology has been created in South Africa and where this technology is being shared with researchers and developers and companies in 15 other middle-income countries such that they can actually develop uh, their own mRNA-based health uh, tools, vaccines and other uh, maybe treatments to protect themselves against uh, the health threats that they are facing. We also have Sam, Brazil, sorry, I will instance. ask you to come to the conclusion, sorry. Yes, yeah. sorry, Michel. I'm, as you know, I uh, <laughs> tend to be a little bit long-winding because this is such an important topic. Maybe just one final, final thing to say is that uh, quite often uh, what we, we, we hear today is that there is investments in local manufacturing capacity. Now, that will not by itself create the equity we need. What we need is to actually share the knowledge and technology uh, uh, such that uh, developers and researchers in the Global South are no longer dependent on the charity uh, response of the, the Global North uh, of the, of the, and, and that they actually can develop the solutions they need uh, for their own health needs. And so one final line, health security cannot be gained by technological competition and business as usual. It's not a war against each other for technolo technological dominance. It actually requires collaboration and sharing because we are all in this together against the virus. I thank you. Thank you very much, Els. Um, as you know, the question is not uh, whether we will have another pandemic in the future, but when. And one of the uh, factors that we may well push us towards an imminent new um, pandemic are actually is the impact on, of climate and health. So I'm really uh, grateful to Honorable Minister uh, Barakat to be with us today and talk us, to us about climate and health and, of course, ahead of the COP28 that will be held here in the UAE. Minister, thank you very much. Thank you very much, and uh, good morning, everybody. Um, one of our uh, senior colleagues in the global health world, uh, Peter Piot, was the first, one of the first to say, you cannot consider pandemic preparedness without taking into consideration climate. Um, and, and how true that is. And if you allow me, I'll just sh share with you some slides to highlight the connection between climate and health. The WHO has stated that climate is the biggest challenge to health of the 21st century. And if you look at a recent report of the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, they say that under a high emission scenario, uh, we're expecting 9 million deaths every year by the end of the century, just on climate reasons alone. Um, if, if countries implement the Paris Agreement by the year 2050, we could be saving 1 million lives every year just from pollution alone. And of course, there's a financial toll in that you know, by the end of this decade, by the year 2030, we're looking at uh, a cost of climate impact on health of between two, two to four billion dollars every year. So climate does a lot of things that impact human health. And uh, you, you will have seen tragic uh, news of flooding, heat waves, um, of course, zoonoses, which means the jump of an, an infection, a disease from an animal to humans, and that's, that's what triggered the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, Vector-borne diseases. Um, vectors are uh, essentially organisms that, cover, that, that carry other uh, 
organisms that cause disease in humans, for instance, mosquitoes. And, uh, and I'll, I'll talk more on, on mosquitoes in a minute. And other things that affect what we call non-communicable disease, like mental, mental health. So climate change has a real impact uh, on human health, and we need to take this very seriously. Um, I'm just going to talk a little on mosquitoes, and forgive me, this is not a nice topic, but just to tell you there are many mosquitoes uh, in the world, and, but these are three of the nastiest on the screen. The one uh, on, your, on the left, Anopheles, carries malaria. The one in the middle, Ides, carries dengue. And the one on the right, uh, Culex, carries West Nile fever. These are all uh, nasty diseases, many of, uh, and, and in many scenarios, especially with children, will cause death. The WHO has stated that climate change is causing a surge in mosquito-related illnesses, particularly malaria and dengue. And we believe it's related to warmer temperatures, uh, redistribution of, of water, human activity. So many things uh, are uh, related to climate are, are causing a, a surge on these illnesses. And this is the burden of malaria. Uh, we're talking about children under the age of five dying from cerebral malaria, uh, entirely preventable. And, and this tragic scenario happens over and over again. We're talking about, you know, of the 619,000 deaths from malaria in the year 2021, about 80% were for children under the age of five. That's half a million children. So half a million children every year, and that's, going to, that's expected to rise. These children are dying from an entirely preventable disease. To add to this, another of the mosquitoes that's called Stephensi, Anopheles Stephensi, having been largely confined to South Asia, is now entering Africa because of warmer temperatures and other things. And the problem with this particular mosquito vector, so this Stephensi carries, carries malaria, the problem with this one is it actually likes to bite during the daytime. So a big mainstay of managing malaria in, in the sub-Saharan region has been giving children uh, bed nets that are covered in insecticides. The problem with this mosquito is that it bites during the day. And if it bites during the daytime, the bed nets are mostly ineffective. You know, you're not, you don't even, it's no point protecting them at night when the biting is also happening in the daytime. Um, and the other worrying thing about this mosquito is that it seems to be resistant to most of the insecticides, particularly the ones used in indoor room spraying. So this is of a concern. Anopheles has a cousin. It's called Ides. We saw it in, in the slide of the mosquitoes. This mosquito carries dengue. And climate change has accelerated the invasion of this mosquito into warmer, uh, into, into other, other climates that are not prepared for it. Um, it carries dengue, and dengue is now uh, spread in many, many uh, countries. And the WHO has said that it's actually present in almost every, in, in every WHO region. It will soon be endemic in the United States and many countries in Europe. And um, the, the number of people that are predisposed to it um, are almost half the numbers of people in the world. The numbers of people who, who have uh, been modeled to have caught it last year were 390 million, uh, of whom just under 100 million were symptomatic, and, and the number of deaths are in the thousands. So this is what we're talking about when, when we are worried about climate change. Moving on to other non-vector issues, like air pollution, we know that over 90% of people breathe unhealthy levels of, of air. Uh, a senior surgeon in, uh, uh, in North India, in New Delhi, um, is well known to speak about these topics. And he said that whereas in the 80s, 90% of his patients with, with lung cancer were, were smokers, he's saying that now, 
uh, half of them are non-smokers, and of those, um, uh, a fifth uh, are actually between the ages, are under the age of 50. So we, we, we really need to take stock of this and start acting. And this is where COP28 comes in. For the first time, a COP is hosting a dedicated day for, clim for, for health issues uh, brought on by climate change. And that day will be on the 3rd of December while COP is being hosted here in the United Arab Emirates in Dubai. Um, and and what COP20, on, on that day, what we hope will happen is that it will be a watershed moment for climate and health where we will uh, raise the issues of, of the seriousness of climate and health issues, lobby support, and hopefully raise the issue of health on the political agenda. There will be the first ever ministerial on climate and health. Um, we will be discussing public health issues, uh, how to build um, systems, health systems that are strong enough to, to deal with the climate changes. Um, and, and also we'll address how to do this in a low carbon uh, way. So there's no point building hospitals that will generate more carbon. Um, we're talking about looking at ways of doing it in a low carbon method. Um, of course, climate change disproportionately affects uh, the most vulnerable uh, in the world, uh, women, children, ethnic minorities, poor communities, migrants or displaced people, other populations, um, and those with underlying health conditions. And we, we have to address how to help developing countries deal, deal with this problem. This is what health system strengthening look li looks like. We won't go through all, all the topics, but it, it's, a, it, it's, a, it's a holistic approach. You can't just take one element and say, this is what a strong health system will look like. You need all the elements, and I will always emphasize leadership and governance. So number one is a very important, important component of a country's response to threats. And of course, the last one is financing. You can't do any of this without dedicated financing for, for, for dealing with, these, uh, with the adaptation. Um, on the Health Day in COP28, uh, we are hope, hoping to uh, proceed with um, endorsement for a, a declaration on climate and health. This declaration was announced uh, during the World Health Summit in Berlin on the 17th of October this year. And we're hoping that before the start of COP, we would have had uh, many countries endorse it. And the declaration essentially is split into three parts. It talks about adaptation, the importance of adaptation to deal with climate health issues. It talks about increasing financing because, you know, we, we cannot, uh, it isn't a matter of taking more money from the climate budget. This needs to find its own source of funding. And then it also talks about the importance of mainstreaming health in all the, all the climate uh, agendas. And, and on my last note, what is the legacy of COP28 when it comes to health? At the end of the day, it's trying to save as many lives as we can by urgent catalytic action. Um, and including novel <coughs> mechanisms for, for looking at, uh, uh, at response. Um, so in, in summary, COP28 will be a call for action for the first time for climate and health issues. So thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Minister. Um, and congratulations to the, uh, for this initiative on bringing health into the COP28, uh, a major challenge for, for the future and pandemic preparedness. At this stage, let me um, say a few words about where are we as a global community from an institutional perspective? Where are we at the global level in uh, moving towards better preparedness to pandemics? Are we drawing the lessons? So, starting point I already mentioned is that despite warnings and past lessons of SARS, H1N1, Ebola, Zika, 
the world was not prepared to COVID-19 because we're going into these cycles of panic and then neglect. And to repeat myself, I do think we are in a phase of neglect again at this time. Last year at, the, um, at this conference, where do I have to press? Can I have the next slide? I have trouble. Thank you. The next one, I'll press again. Okay. Last year at this conference, Ambassador uh, Anders Nordström, um, who was part of the independent panel on pandemic preparedness uh, and response, of which I, I was also privileged to be a member, talked about the six main recommendations that came out of the independent panel work uh, to the international community. One is the need for sustained high-level political attention and leadership. We have lacked strong leadership and coordination in our response to COVID-19. The second is modernizing our surveillance and alert system so that we can respond much faster to uh, infectious <clears throat> outbreaks in the future. The third, as El Storelli discussed, is to build a new platform that will ensure equitable access to all in need to medical countermeasures. The fourth, and thank you, Minister Barakat, for mentioning that, is that we need new funding we need new funding, funding for pandemic preparedness and response. Fifth, we need a strong, independent, well-funded, well-functioning World Health Organization. And six, at national level, all governments must start investing in better preparedness now. And following what Antoine Flao said earlier, one of the obvious areas of work is improving ventilation and quality of the air. The next slide. So at the global level, there are three out ongoing processes out of the four that we had been recommended as recommending as an independent panel. The first is that for the first time in history, a special session, high level meeting on pandemic prepar preparedness and response was held at the uh, UN in September 23, in the margins of the last uh, General Assembly with a political declaration. Uh, I must say that uh, this was a high-level meeting, but it was hardly attended by any <coughs> high-level head of state. Uh, and none of the European uh, major heads of states was there. No Chancellor Scholz, no President Macron, no British Prime Minister, no Madame van der Leyen, no one present, which to me is a strong signal of, of the phase of neglect where we are. Minister Barakat, we met in New York, so you were there. Uh, congratulations to the UAE. Um, the second is that we have now started um, negotiations in Geneva since February 2022 of a new pandemic treaty, a treaty that would be a binding treaty according to international law. And this is negotiated under the auspices of WHO. You may know that in the constitution of WHO, there is room for negotiation of international treaties. The first one that WHO had negotiation, negotiated was the International Convention on Tobacco. Third, there is a more technical process of revising what is called the international health regulations, but that is a very, very sensitive negotiation because this is where we're discussing about where, how countries will inform the world about new pathogens and also whether WHO will have or will not have the ability to move to a country and investigate a new outbreak in case it happens. The fourth, which is not currently in discussions, is that we had proposed that 
there is a Global Health Threat Council established something like a Security Council on threats, so to elevate the issue of leadership, as we were discussing with uh, Madame Barakat, um, the Secretary General of the UN, uh, Antonio Guterres, came with an alternative uh, suggestion a few months ago, suggesting that the UN creates, next to the Security Plat uh, Council, a platform on all threats <laughs> that are, let's say, non-military, uh, food, water, climate and health. And that will be discussed at the Summit of the Future uh, next year. Next slide. So the big issues, next slide please. The big issues at stake in these discussions are governance, the topic of this conference, financing, and in terms of financing, we need financing in order to prepare ourselves to the next pandemic, we also need surge financing in case something happens. And then, as else alluded to, we need to build uh, regional resilience so that in every region of the world, there is now an ability to develop, research, manufacture, and distribute global common goods that are personal protective equipment, oxygen, vaccines, therapies uh, that are essential in containing an infectious outbreak where and when it occurs. The next slide. As we speak, the latest draft of the pandemic treaty is on the table in Geneva, and there are four very sensitive issues that are being debated. One is access to pathogens. You may know that in 2007, during H1N1, Indonesia said that it will not communicate the sequence of the virus to the global community because, and I make it simpler here, they said if we give this sequence to the world and then it serves the rich country industry to produce vaccines that will be sold to us as at unaffordable prices, then this is unfair. So there is a, a lot of discussion now in the pandemic treaty this negotiations around whether country should always give free uh, sort of uh, um, access to their path the new pathogens or whether a country that provides the information should have benefits uh, from that information. Then there are major debates around medical countermeasures, as uh, Els uh, Torelli alluded to, including the sensitive issues of intellectual property, of research and development, modalities of technology transfer. There are discussions about financing. Financing pandemic preparedness is a global issue for everyone. So we all agree that everyone should contribute to funding pandemic preparedness, whether you're a rich country or a poor country, but of course with so-called differentiated responsibilities, and that's what is difficult to <coughs> define in the negotiations. And finally, WHO had suggested that it could come up itself with a system of providing equitable access of countermeasures, vaccines, therapeutics uh, to the world, and that is uh, being negotiated. I don't think at this time that it is likely that these negotiations will come to an agreement by the deadline of May 2024. More time will probably be needed, but viruses don't wait, and that's the problem. Let me add an optimistic note here, which is that whatever the challenge is, there is a, a word that is everywhere, every day in the negotiations, which is equity, and I think the main lessons uh, that everyone has been drawing from the pandemic is unequitable access, and now we need to find a system that would guarantee equity. Next slide. Now, as in every negotiation, uh, now the geopolitics are there. 
and uh, the difficult negotiations that we're currently witnessing in Geneva show how closely health is now intertwined with geopolitics and particularly between the tensions between the global north and the global south. Your Holiness Bartholomew, you alluded to that in your speech, talking about the fact that they occur so strongly despite the diversity of the south. I think I'm quoting you here. And that is what we're seeing. Vaccine nationalism, the fact that the rich countries overbought all of the vaccines as they became available with no access to poor country has really left profound scars that we see in the negotiating uh, scene uh, in Geneva. And then, of course, there is much less trust at this time in the multilateral system and then domestic, uh, international, but also partisan uh, political agendas has somehow forcefully entered into the global health discussions. Think of the attacks on WHO by President Trump and his administration, or the misinformation campaigns from the uh, Bolsonaro team. So that unfortunately, uh, the pandemic and health uh, is no longer the one issue that brings uh, countries together uh, in those negotiations, it's in fact contributing to the polarization of our geopolitical uh, world. Uh, next slide. So what is clear now is that uh, global health, as I put it, is a matter of global politics. And that is why, Thierry, we need global health in the WPC, uh, as you uh, allowed it to, to, to happen. Because the pandemic at national level has impacted every sector of policy making, and therefore at national level, it is no more just an issue of ministers <coughs> of health, it's an issue of whole of government, and at global level, it's an issue that is negotiated now at the level of heads of states, ministers of finance, ministers of trade, ministers of development. It's a key issue at the G7. We will hear from Aruka in a minute. At the G20, it is on the agenda of the UN General Assembly and all regional organizations such as the African Union or the European uh, Union. And it's become particularly an important interface between health and foreign affairs. And I think it is remarkable that in the UAE, we have a minister, uh, an assistant minister of health uh, and research within the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So the next slide and the last slide, the question is, are we ready for the next pandemic? To me, the answer is no, we're not. But it is our choice uh, if we want it to be so. It's a choice now to put in place measures that will allow us to identify new outbreaks rapidly and to respond to them in speed where and when they occur and prevent an infectious outbreak from becoming an epidemic or becoming a pandemic and becoming a social and economic catastrophe such as the one we've seen. And to, para to quote here Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, President Sirleaf, who was the chair of the with Madame Clark of the independent panel, she said, new pandemic threats are inevitable, but pandemics are a political choice. The political choice whether we stop a, a, an outbreak or whether we let it move to the pandemic stage. Let me say, uh, I think the ongoing processes, however difficult they are, offer an unprecedented opportunity now for the world for focus and transformative change. Thank you. So with this, uh, let's move to our next speaker. And our next speaker is uh, Haruka Sakamoto. And uh, she uh, has been, she is a senior fellow at the Tokyo Foundation for Policy Research. And she has been tightly involved in the work of the G7 Health and the G7 
in preparation okay. for, for the uh, Hiroshima uh, summit this year. And I must say that to us in the global health community, uh, achievements in the declarations of the health G7 and of the G7 have been remarkable in the tense climate uh, of negotiations that we currently face. So, Haruka, thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much for inviting me today. Uh, so, Japan hosted G7 summit this year in Hiroshima, and then pandemic preparedness was one of the major topics at the G7 this year. But in 2016, Japan hosted the last G7 summit. Pandemic preparedness was also a main topic. At that time, there was an Ebola virus outbreak in the West African countries. And then the significant amount of discussion has been made how we can prepare for the future pandemics. Since then, many effort has been done for preventing the, another pandemic. But as we all know, we could not prevent the COVID-19. So in this backdrop, Japanese government again picked up pandemic preparedness is one of the key topics at the G7 with a specific focus on governance, financing, and global rule making. First is about governance. I think this is not only the issue for the health sectors, but if any kind of global crisis happens, such as climate change, energy crisis, or recent Gaza situation, who or which country or which organization to taking a leadership role is a really difficult question. I think this is the same to the health sector. So if the pandemic of the global scale happens, which country or which organization or who takes the leadership role is a really, really big issue. Of course, we have the WHO, but as just Michelle mentioned, now global pandemic or global health is not only the issues within the health sector, but this is intertwined with several other sectors. In this regard, which, or which organization, which country, or who taking leadership role is a really, really big issue in the governance. So Japanese government pick up the governance of the pandemic preparedness as one of the key points of the, this year's summit. And of course, we have the WHO, where health ministers across the globe gathers and then discuss with the technical aspect of the pandemic preparedness. But this year's G7 also highlighted the importance of having a higher level, head of the state's level dialogue platform, which head of the states of the each country discuss not only the impact on the health sectors, but also the pandemic poses on the other sectors, such as trade or economy. And next point is about financing. We need money in order to prevent spread of the viruses. But the question is, who make a financial contribution to the global pandemic? Especially like the COVID-19, many high-income countries are also largely affected by the COVID-19. And then those countries has no, not adequate capacity to financially support low- and middle-income countries. In that case, who or which country make a financial contribution to a global scale. So G20, not G7, took a leadership role and then created the new financing mechanism, so-called a pandemic fund. <coughs> and that this is the basic idea of the pandemic fund, is asking the donor country to make a financial contribution to the pandemic fund. And then G7 this year also highlighted importance of the pandemic fund and then actually financially contributed to the pandemic fund and then showing their support to the pandemic fund. But still, because the, since after the Lehman shock, the money coming from the G7 countries or traditional donor country has been stagnated. And then when global scale of pandemic happens, the money coming from the, those traditional donors is not adequate at all. And we really need to mobilize resources other than G7 countries, including the private sector or market. And then there is a still ongoing debate that how we can mobilize 
the money from the private sector or market is an ongoing debate, and we really need to consider such kind of the financial mechanism. And the third one is about the global rulemaking, which Michelle already explained the detail about the pandemic treaty. And I think this is not an easy roadmap to agree upon the pandemic treaty, because there is so many conflicting interests between or among countries. But again, this year of the G7, I think G7 is a country with a shared value, showing the support for the pandemic treaty as kind of the sending a political message that we need to unite in order to prevent for the future pandemics. I also would like to highlight the importance of the innovation of the pharmaceuticals. So when next pandemic happens, and if we can create vaccines more quickly, we can save more lives, which is good. So of course, innovation is a key for the future pandemics. At the same time, there are many challenges and concerns regarding the innovation for the pharmaceuticals. First one is the supply chain risks. Second one is technological transfer together with intellectual property rights issues. And the third one is equitable access and delivery. First one is the supply chain risks. So now, most of the all pharmaceuticals its ingredients or original materials are largely rely on China. And any country, even the United States, cannot complete the supply chain of the pharmaceuticals without China, and which now recognize as a kind of the security risks. And then there's now considering how we can secure or diversify the supply chain is one issue. And second point is the technological transfer. So even if we succeed, and the vaccination research and development, we need to do several millions of vaccination. But usually, country does not have such manufacturing capacities. So whenever a global pandemic happens, we need to cooperate with a country having a manufacturing capacity at a large scale, such as China, India, or South Africa, or several other countries. But rapidly transferred the new technology is always a concern, especially together with the intellectual property rights. So we also need to enhance the capacity at a global scale. Together, we need to consider how we transfer those technology at a timely manner. And then we also need to consider how we deal with the intellectual property rights, especially during the pandemic. And lastly, about the equitable access and delivery of the vaccines. I think that this point has already uh, echoed with the other panelists, but the equitable access was a very key issue during the COVID-19. So many high-income countries bought a huge amount of vaccine, while the low-income countries has no access to the such vaccination. So we also need to create how we secure the equitable access and delivery of the, those medical countermeasures. So lastly, I'd like to touch upon the relationship between the climate change and then health, which are already mentioned from the assistant health ministers. So health sector also emits significant amount of the CO2. So if health sector is a country, the total amount of emission of CO2 is the fourth largest in the world. During the COVID-19, thanks to the vaccination, we could save many lives. But at the same time, there was a huge amount of medical waste and it put a significant burden on the environment. So before, health sector only to concentrate saving lives anyway. But now, health sector is also recognized that health sector also has a load to the climate change, which means we need to prepare for the future pandemic. We need to promote innovation for the pharmaceuticals, or we need to attain equitable access of the pharmaceutical while we need to decrease the greenhouse emission, or we need to attain net zero emission in the health sector. But let's think that, is it really possible that we deliver the vaccine at the last one mile of the every country with no greenhouse emission? I think this is a really quite tough question, but we need to consider it.
So in the conclusion, I think the, uh, the question to the, uh, are we ready for the future pandemic? I think there is still no, but we need to learn from the lessons from the COVID-19. And then also now, we need to think about the climate change perspective whenever we do something for the future pandemic. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Haruka. Um, and thank you to Japan for uh, emphasizing so strongly equity um, in the G7 uh, and also uh, in, in New York. I, I heard uh, Minister Takemi uh, speak and equity was always at, at the top and the forefront of his interventions. Our last speaker uh, will provide us with uh, uh, a few thoughts about how Europe is preparing for the next pandemic. And um, um, the speaker is Jacques Biot, who I suppose is well known to this group, a former director of the Ecole Polytechnique in France. Jacques, the floor is yours. Thank you, Michel, and uh, thank you to uh Thierry, of course, for this uh, kind invitation. It's, uh, it's both a honor and a privilege to be here with all of you, and I learn a lot from uh, other panels. So uh, just one word to say that I have no conflict of interest on this one, in view of my other uh, positions, and that views expressed here are uh, my own. Um, as I was aware that I would be the last hurdle before, the, before lunch, I think, uh, I have only four slides after this one. So we'll first look into lessons to learn from how Europe fared with uh, COVID-19. Uh, and then we'll try to look at the ingredients of, of a pandemic management. And then we'll try to assess the key performance indicators of Europe in terms of preparedness. And, and I will try to uh, make a conclusion. So how did Europe fare with COVID-19? Well, I'd say not, not that bad, you know. We are very good at uh, really uh, uh, chasing ourselves uh, in Europe, but, but I mean, this is not legible from the back of the room, but basically the circles show the European countries. This is a graph uh, from uh, the John Hopkins Institute, which uh, followed the statistics of, uh, of COVID. And, and this graph only focuses on the 20 most affected countries. So you see, um, you see that actually Europe is pretty much uh, in the average. The very good ones uh, were uh, mostly Asian countries, uh, South Korea and Japan, uh, and the less good, I would say, uh, uh, guys were mostly, well, Peru, which was clearly an outlier, and, uh, and, and the US in terms of mortality. The graph on the right is, not, is, is the case fatality ratio, which shows that on this respect, many Western European countries were pretty good at limiting the impact. So they had a high morbidity, but they were able to uh, limit uh, the, uh, I would say, the impact of the disease, probably because the health systems were, were pretty good. Now, if you go into a more detailed assessment and you look at all countries in Europe, you will see that, I mean, we had some countries, especially in uh, Eastern Europe, which were pretty badly affected and which didn't fare as well as those ones. So my take on that one would be that, well, there, there wasn't really such a thing as Europe because there were pretty, uh, I would say, unequal responses in terms of time and uh, management. Uh, the Europeans, for instance, left our Italian friends for a long while, uh, completely alone with what was happening in Lombardia. Um, the Brits, which at that time were still, uh, I would say, uh, in Europe, uh, made their own, I would say, policy. But still, there is one great success which I think we should recognize, which is the decision by the Commission to procure vaccines as soon as they were ready on a centralized basis in order to avoid competition between countries. And I think really that was the, one of the first times where really Europe played a very important role in terms of taking care of, uh, of its citizens in a, in a practical way. Now, what are the ingredients for pandemics management that has been touched upon quite a lot by, by other speakers? What we should remind is that the next pandemics will not necessarily be 
it's like co like COVID, you know? I mean, uh, uh, Antoine showed us that uh, COVID-19 was airborne, but, but if you look at his, the history of epidemics, there were plenty of epidemics which were not airborne, which were contact-borne, water-borne, and, and so um, Michel said that the, the next pandemic is a certainty we don't know. We only don't know when, and I would add, we only don't know which bug. And, and the bugs may differ in terms of the uh, way of transmission, uh, with a big question very often, which is at which time does the bug become, I mean, with, at which time does the transmission become interhuman, uh, if the bug comes from somewhere else. Uh, I would add another division in, in the classification of bugs, which is whether they are susceptible or not to uh, humoral immunity and to uh, which is what you use basically for uh, for covid vaccination let's remember that even with uh, rna we, we still don't have a vaccine against aids uh, after 20 like 30 years of research we don't have a vaccine against malaria or we hardly have one uh, etc and and we had issues with the dengue vac dengue vaccine so I mean, mankind was pretty lucky and talented, uh, to quote uh, Woody Allen, but, but uh, in having a vaccine so fast, because, I mean, with other bugs, it, it could become much more, much more difficult. If on the right side, the, the graph is much, pretty much a consultant's graph, uh, which I borrowed from the uh, European CDC, been a consultant for many years, so I'm not, this is not pejorative, but basically I tried to see what do you need in terms of, of practical skills if you want to implement the skill of preparedness and the response and the feedback. And I think if you ask the layman in the, in the street, they would pretty much think that, um, I mean, pandemic management relies mostly on epidemiology, if they know what this means, and, and infectiology, and uh, that this is a health issue. But it's, it's not just a health issue. It's uh, an issue where you will need to test and trace and contain and protect. And, uh, and so you will need people versed with law and order, because if you lock people down, you don't do this without having riots or protestations or things like that. You will need, you may need environmental measures. And, and I was happy to hear about the climate impact because I mean, for instance, you may want to reduce uh, a source of pollution which is aggravating the disease, etc. So I'm not going into detail of this, but let's remember it's not just a health issue. It's, uh, it's really a, a political issue which involves almost every part of an administration. Now, where is Europe from this respect? Well, first of all, you need institutions. I mean, uh, I mean, pandemic preparedness cannot rely on uh, on disorder, and and that's where you immediately face some, I would say, questions, uh, because I mean, if you, for those of you who've been read, who've been reading the uh, recent book by uh, Agnès Buzyn, who is a friend and, and the former minister of health, where she explains how she lived the beginning of the epidemics, you see that it was really difficult for her to find who would make the right decision, and, and she was kind of going from one person to another one, and although she was a medic and she had a feeling that something bad was coming. So the coordination between WHO and the EC, ECDC, ECDC and HERA, which is a new agency which uh, Europe created, which is uh, basically for uh, health emergency response and uh, awareness, um, and, and the role of the Commission, and the role of the governance in view of subsidiarity. I mean, nobody really could say how this is going to be coordinated. We in France are very good at creating coordinators, but usually we create so many of them that you need somebody to coordinate the coordinators. And so we, we are still at the stage where, I mean, we will need some uh, agreement between the various parties. Um, as mentioned, it's not just health, it's uh, health, but it also involves uh, foreign ministers if you need to close borders. Uh, you need the home office if you need to lock people down and uh, check that they don't get from, out from their uh, homes. Uh, you need local authorities. And here again, you will need to uh, balance the, uh, the responsibilities. And certainly you need central decision making but also you need local action. And uh, in, in Europe, it often happens that uh, there is kind of a, a divide between both ends of the chain. 
in terms of, of uh, epidemiology and public health, I think we, we had a lot of, uh, of, of scientific deglobalization just in the wake of the global, I would say, deglobalization. Uh, and, and I think scientists really need to speak together. Whatever happens, uh, I mean, uh, whenever kind of fighters and the combatants are fighting each other or, uh, or distrusting each other, but we need scientists to be able to travel and uh, talk and exchange data, and that's certainly something which uh, we, we must emphasize for the next pandemics. Um, in terms of containment, Europe has a specific issue because we have what is called the Schengen uh, setting, and so you don't close borders like that. So uh, if, if we have to lock down, uh, this will be a difficult issue. And finally, in terms of finding the cure and the protection, um, I really, um, I think we need to realize that there has been a steep decline in, the, uh, uh, in life science research. And uh, if you look at the Nobel Prizes and uh, at, at many, many uh, publications, uh, many of them were not done in, in Europe. We still have very strong uh, research institutions, and I'm not going to quote them all, uh, but uh, in Germany, in the UK, in uh, Italy, in, in France, in Switzerland, I mean, really have great institutions, but they don't receive the, the amount of uh, public funding that their American or Chinese counterparts, or probably Japanese counterparts, would receive. Um, we clearly have a pharma industry decline, I mean, because of cost containment for decades, and we also face the same issue that was mentioned of, uh, of drug shortages, which I would want to uh, emphasize is mostly due to the fact that, I mean, authorities have not been attentive enough to the fact that within a production chain, which usually uh, includes uh, tens of uh, steps, uh, one step is in the hands of, 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 a, of a lonely, of only one uh, producer. And whether he's Chinese or wherever, I mean, we, we had shortages in Europe which were due to uh, uh, problems in uh, facilities in, uh, in, in Sweden or in Italy or in France. So it's not, once again, let's not just blame the Chinese for uh, having taken the industry. I think it's more a question of procurement and, uh, and making procurement uh, safer in, uh, in the pharma industry. Plus, the pharma industry has completely I would say outsourced its uh, research, and uh, and that's by the way, good thing because that's how we had the vaccines for 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 COVID, but but I mean the French the sorry the European uh, um, pharma industry is certainly much weaker than what it was uh, 20 years ago, and um, and and then finally we have and this was emphasized by Antoine. I mean, with the Trump example, but we also have a high level of uh, anti-vax sentiment in Europe, and that's something which would make uh, protection difficult. So, my takeaways, um, I think we really must, everybody who is responsible in uh, politics, we must avoid looking for scapegoats. Uh, I think in the beginning of the epidemics, there were many people who tried to blame others and, I mean, when, when there is a pandemic, it's not the time to blame others. It's the time to work together, and uh, that's uh, something very important. And, and at the time of ex-Twitter, now ex, uh, and, uh, and social networks, it's, it's really difficult to protect those who make decisions, and, and that's a, a big issue, not just in healthcare, but it's an issue here. Um, we really... I mean, need to see how we can prolong the idea of the, uh, of the centralized vaccine procurement scheme, because at, at this stage it was to some extent one shot, but, but how can we make this happen in the future? Uh, because with another commission you don't know what, what might happen. Um, we need to really build again medical staff, because all over Europe we are lacking physicians, and that's a, that's a big issue, not just for pandemics, but it will be an issue for pandemics. Um, we have, based, in general, a profound decay of, uh, of public health uh, systems because of course containments that, that has been going for, for years. 
uh, we definitely need more public education. You know, education was raised in several panels during this conference, and I think it has to do with the economy, but I mean, much of the anti-vax sentiment and the resistance to lockdowns, etc., is due to the fact that our populations are, are less and less educated, and we need to really put a focus on education. And that's my last uh, bullet point, really improve the priority for science. I'm, I'm struck by the distrust for science, uh, which you can find in the, the population, but also among politicians and, uh, and among uh, media and decision makers. And so I think we should all strive to say that humanity will prosper if, you, if we encourage science and uh, rely on science. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Jacques, and thank you for your uh, plea for science. If there's one success, uh, to the COVID pandemic, it's really open science. There's been no borders and uh, there's been new systems put in place uh, that really have allowed a wide and rapid communication of scientific innovations. We have time for one or two burning questions. Yes, Jean? There's a, can we have the microphone? Oh, I just wanted to ask, is uh, diffusion of insects uh, has to do with a ban on pesticide? Because you assume that it was related to climate change. From what I know, insects love water more than uh, eat. So we had malaria in Europe uh, in the 19th century, and malaria disappeared because we used insecticide. So uh, what do you think of uh, uh, that point of view? Thank you. Um, maybe can I turn that question first to Antoine and then maybe, Minister, would you like to add something? Antoine? Yes, thank you for, for this question, uh, Jean de carvas -Doué. I, I think um, uh, you're right, it's a complex issue and it's not just a question of climate change uh, about the insect. Um, what is not completely true is that the role of, uh, of the temperature is key. Um, when there is, um, um, it depends on the vector. Uh, when, for, for Anopheles, for instance, um, having um, a warm temperature and flooding uh, favor uh, its, its propagation and proliferation. And uh, we have seen in, uh, for instance, in the highlands of, some, of, of Zimbabwe, to take one example, uh, when the, the mosquito was not able uh, to proliferate uh, where Harare, the capital, is, is now a place due to the global warming which is prone to the vector proliferation. For the dengue mosquito, it is a, a bit another is story because it's uh, the warm weather and the dry conditions which favor surprisingly or paradoxically the proliferation of, of the mosquito. And because of the drought, you collect waters and you store the water close to your home and then the, the mosquito proliferate very close to you in the garden uh, where you have this collection of, of, of dormant water for, for weeks. So it's a complex issue. It's not only a question of global warming, but global warming play a leading role. Thank you. Minister? Uh, thank you. And, and just very briefly to add to that, uh, just to show the point, there are areas in the world that have eliminated malaria that are now seeing new... Uh, locally uh, sourced malaria. So, for instance, some states in, in, in the United States of America, they're facing new cases of malaria caught within the country and not brought from another. That, that's the, uh, a real example of uh, uh, implications of what we're talking about. Thank you. So, with this, I see we're on time. And I'd like to ask you to join me in thanking uh, all our panelists for a fantastic session. Thank you all. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.